You're listening to a podcast from the Finnish Football Show. Yes, you've joined the Finnish Football Show. We're uh, here, three of us, to talk about mainly uh, the end or the, the summary of Finland's games at the Women's Euros 2022. Three group games. Uh, we're talking about this uh, the Thursday afterwards. Uh, I'm Rich, and uh, this week I'm joined by Keke. Hello, mate. Hello. And Ali Manson. Hello. Moika. Welcome. Now, uh, between us, we attended all three of the group games in Milton Keynes. It was a, a nice little jolly. I mean, the, the less said about Milton Keynes itself, the better. But it was a, a nice stadium. And uh, all in all, the fin, Finnish fans did a very good job of pretty much turning Milton Keynes into a, a suburb of Helsinki, which was nice. So, uh, yes, unfortunately, uh, as we're recording, yeah, F- Finland lost all three group games, but um, we'll, we'll go through them in, in a semblance of order and we'll, we'll start with the first one. Now, Keke, you were the only one of us who were there for the, the Spain game and uh, what a start. Yeah, it was unbelievable. I mean, first of all, you mentioned there how many how many Finns are in attendance. I think the... Um, the, the actual, the, the full attendance for that first game was something like getting up to 17,000, which um, which at the, at the time of the game had played was like a record for a, for a women's Euro group stage that didn't contain a, uh, a host nation. So it was, um, it was a fantastic attendance. Um, I think at the, at the last count, there was, there was over 1,500 sort of getting on for maybe 2,000 Finnish fans in there. And yeah, what a, what an atmosphere! It was it was absolutely brilliant, and um, and we got off to the perfect start after after just I think it was 45, 50 seconds. Linda Salström she uh, had the ball in the back of the Spanish net, and um, everyone was going bananas in the stands. There was uh, what well, the people who had made their way to the stand already. There was there was some some still coming out of the bar or making their way to their their seats and that. But um, but yeah, those, those of us who were who were down in the stands sort of spun round, started hugging everyone and um, and yeah, here we go. The Euro adventure was off to a good start. I think um, b- before the game, obviously Spain had lost a couple of their key players to injury, but um, all the build-up to the tournament, all the previews and, and summaries and everything had, this was the group of death and you got three teams battling it out and Finland. Yeah. And I guess after after a minute of game one, when one of, I wouldn't say Spain are the three tournament favourites or anything, but I mean, definitely one of the bigger sides in the competition and definitely having a bloody nose. I mean, it was a, it was a, a wonderful long, I say long ball makes it sound derogatory, but I think a, a, a targeted Hollywood pass from Anna Westerland dissecting the Spanish centre halves. And uh, it was a fantastic finish from Linda. 47 seconds it was. There you go. 47 seconds of heaven. So, uh, and it took, um, it took Spain a good while to kind of re- regroup from that. I guess no one would have expected Finland to come out swinging like that. And uh, yeah, I think for, for a little while, it definitely knocked them out of sync and it took them quite a while to get into it. But um, I mean, Ali, you've, you've seen the highlights of the game. What, what was your impression of, of Finland's performance after that? Well, yeah, I think, I think you're spot on. It definitely took Spain maybe a good 15, 20 minutes to really realise what had, what had happened to them. And for the first 20 minutes, it really felt that, that Finland were getting first to the ball. They were pressing really well. They were closing down all the space in the midfield. Uh, they were winning all the second balls as well. And I was sort of looking, looking at it around sort of the 20-minute mark. And yeah, Spain had a lot of the ball and, you know, most of the possession but I still thought do you know what this isn't like a a total backs to the wall jobby of course later on it it did sort of it it got more difficult as the first half progressed I think you know when we got to the the 25th minute um, I think yeah Spain equalized with Paredes from the the corner sort of 25th 26th minute Um, I mean it was brilliant header I mean some of the marking could have been a bit questionable I mean all three the first three goals were all headers weren't they so um, yeah yeah which is obviously you know something that maybe in the future they need to look at but I thought the first 25 minutes there was some really good work in there um, and stuff that they can definitely you know draw upon for 
you know, possibly future games against bigger nations in the future. Yeah, um, and and when you look at it as a whole, as you say, Spain got three headed goals in in that game, and um, Tini Corpola made nine saves in the match, which for a goalkeeper at any level, let alone a European Championships, is pretty special. And um, and and you kind of think about Finland's story throughout the tournament. They they lost Natalia Koika for this game anyway because she had a an illness after before the uh, the friendly against the Netherlands and going on from that throughout they then lost um Hurunen had covid um uh Adelina Engman had an injury and missed the Denmark game and then Tinny herself got covid and Anna Vesterlund got covid and it was just an absolute shower really quite frankly of of the way things were and um and when you come away from this game, obviously Finland led for, for a period of time. No one expected, and to be fair at the start of the tournament, not many people gave Finland a chance. But to go into this game, or sorry, to come out of this game 4-1 and then going into the Denmark game, because Denmark lost to Germany. It was 2-0, but it was, sorry, it was 4-0. And yeah. 4-0 probably flattered Germany, to be honest. Uh, sorry, flattered Denmark. I think it was a very one-sided game. And then going into that Denmark game, it was a lot closer. Um, and the three of us were there, which was a, a great experience. You know, we all went to, to sunny Milton Keynes. <sighs> but um, yeah, it was a, a nice experience. And again, you know, a, a decent turnout. The, the whole attendance, I think, was around 11,000 that day. But the, uh, the Finns definitely outnumbered the Danes. But um, Ali, what was your impression of, uh, of the match? Um, well, first of all, I, I think... The game was sort of built up as, you know, that well, we know that the loser goes home, essentially, and it definitely felt that that's how the game started. Uh, I thought Finland, in part, did really well, again, particularly in the midfield, uh, but Denmark definitely target, targeted uh, our left flank and the left back area, and so many of their attacks were coming down their right-hand side. Um because that was uh, it was um, was it Ellie Pukuyansa who was Pukuyansa, playing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, who was playing left and she started centre back against Spain. So uh, I don't know how many times she's played left back, but I mean, it definitely felt that Denmark had targeted that area, and and you know, eventually, that's where you know later on in the game, that's where they got their goal from, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a second. Um, but I, I felt, you know, generally the passing was all, I mean, Denmark did have more possession. Um, but across the board, the first half was pretty cagey. But, you know, when it's nil-nil, you always go into the second half with hope. And uh, I don't think any of us were sort of feeling too down about the first half performance. <laughs> no, I mean, um, first of all, it was it was great for all three of us to be there in the stadium together. It was fantastic. And again, you know, the atmosphere was brilliant. We got to give a, a big shout out to all the SME Corps members and um, Amigo sort of you know, was uh, capo and um, keeping everyone singing and rocking. It was it was really really fantastic. And yeah, it was you know as you say this this game was the one that we were looking at where okay if we're gonna if we're gonna hang on in this competition and get some points this is the one that we we want to be want to be winning. And yeah, that, I mean the first half performance it it was it was decent going in at the break nil nil. The game was it was anybody's for the taking really. And um, yeah, I mean obviously uh, Anna Signuel was was forced into a couple of changes. What with the the illnesses and the injury to um, to Adelina Engman, but you know Essie Sanio came in. She played. She played absolutely fantastic. I mean, we'll get to the end of the game in due course, but you could see it by the end. You know, like um, not just Essie, but every single one of those players had had absolutely left everything out there on the pitch. That you couldn't fault the effort. You know, and as I said, going in at going in at half time, nil nil. I think we all had smiles on our faces as we made our way to the bar. We were sort of like, you know, this this game's there for the taking, and um, and yeah, we we was all all happy at that point. Yeah, it was it was definitely a lot closer than the second game and, and I think um, across the team uh, we kind of saw that that Denmark looked like they were taking Finland's strengths into account and I think that was something that that Spain didn't do Spain didn't felt like they didn't need to uh, mm. and I think that was what gave them the bloody nose at the start of that match but when it came to Denmark and and we'll, we'll come on to this shortly but Linda Selström afterwards talked about how the Danish defence dropped deep 
they knew that her, her strength was running in behind them. They saw the Spain game, but they've still not seen it over over a long career of her running in behind the defenders, and they were very, very deep. And and for a team that was supposedly the superior one, they really did look at countering Finland's strength. And I think a lot of that was was Finland really struggling to um, to break that down purely because of, of Denmark. But yeah, we got we, yeah we got to half time, and then um, and then I think as the second half started, um, this was where. I think a lot of people in in both the stands and on the on social media, I think, started to see a bit of a a, a bit of a pattern forming. That we don't want to go into too much negativity at this point, but um, Denmark definitely made a lot more of their squad, shall we say? Um, they made uh, some substitutions. Finland, I think, made one during the second half quite late on and then, and then one sort of towards injury time. But um, yeah, it was definitely a sea change there between the two sides. But um, when Denmark have one of Europe's best players in Pernil Harder uh, scoring, and to be fair, the goal, I think by the time she got the contact on it on 72 minutes that put the ball over the line, she was about three inches out. So yeah, uh, yeah it was unlucky. I mean, the, the header went off the bar and kind of at a strange angle that, that got through what was left of the Finnish defence. And, um, and she had a, is a decent finish, but yeah, she, she, it was harder to miss. I think. I don't know. It was. Um, it was. A, it was a. She had to sort of stretch. She was. She was sort of had to lean back and, and get her mm. head onto that ball. But you're right. It was. Um, it was a not a bizarre goal to concede. But you're right. It's sort of the, the initial shot or cross, whatever you want to call it, coming into the box, sort of cannoned off the bar. And the only place you didn't want it to sort of end up or rebound to was. Um, Berlin Harder's head, and that's exactly where it went. But um, but yeah, you're right, Rich. I mean, the the Danish coach sort. I think there was four subs around the hour mark, and and it, that really did sort of tell the story. And 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 you're right. I mean, um, Anna Signuel, she's she's taken a bit of criticism for being a bit too rigid and um, and maybe not using her bench as much as she could. And yeah, I mean, um, Olga Artinen came on around getting on towards 10 minutes to go, I think. And then right at the end in injury time, you know, Danielson came on. But by then it was sort of, well, we thought it might be too little too late, but you know, had an absolutely fantastic shot right at the, right at the end that, um, you know, had our, our hearts in our mouths for a minute and thinking that we were, were going to nick a point. But, um, but yeah, just, uh, I, I, yeah, just, um, just didn't make it into the net, but absolute, absolutely belting shot. So, um, but uh, yeah, the, the day after I went up and spoke to some of the girls and I think if you've listened to that episode, um, you will have heard. And if you haven't, you know, click back and, and have a listen. You will have heard, you know, Danielson maybe with some veiled criticism and saying, you know, that she was after. She's after more minutes. She's hungry. She wants to get on the pitch. And, you know, I think, um, yeah, after I came away from there thinking, oh, you know, that was a bit of a, a bit of a bit of a dig at the manager there. Yeah, and I mean, Ali, we we left the stadium together. Um, again, Finland had been eliminated at this point, I think, and the, the kind of post-mortem was beginning, I think, as as we were kind of watching things un, unfold on social media and as we were sort of going back with the back to London with the, the Finnish and Danish fans. And um, it's, it's, it's a difficult position to be in when, when Finland qualified extremely well for yeah. this tournament. And... And there can't be any criticism of the coach for that. I mean, she'd been in the job for five years. That that group, which had a lot of potential difficulty in Finland, weren't the top seeds and was navigated relatively smoothly. They didn't lose. I think they, only, I think they drew two of the games, but otherwise won every game and only conceded a handful of goals. Um, but yeah, I mean, going from that to this tournament here where you're playing certainly one of the pre-tournament favourites in Germany. You've got very, very good opposition in Dan- Denmark and Spain. It's um, it's a bit of a step up and it was quite obvious in the end, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it really was. And I think what's been really interesting, I think definitely being back here in, in Finland is noticing how the press have reacted to the tournament as well. Um, because I think, you know, we, we can... We can stand there when we're watching and, and and note things down and you know have our own opinions and criticize and whatever. Um, but now that the sort of dust has settled, uh, it's certainly felt that you know a, a change, you know, is probably the right thing. Uh, I mean, I don't want to get 
you know, too negative because I think there was some good work throughout the tournament. I think, you know, it, it's clear that for, particularly from playing out from the back into the midfield, there's some there's some good work going on there. There's some control there. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll get to the, the Germany game in a minute. And I do have something positive to say about the Germany game, <laughs> which I don't know, might be, it, it, it's hard, but I, I definitely found a positive one, but we'll, we'll come to that later on. But, you know, you, you look at the stats from the fin, Finland-Denmark game and you, you look at it and you go, okay, yeah, 1-0 win to Denmark, you know, 19 shots to nine, five on target to two, 56 possession to 44. They probably deserve to win. Um, but within that, you know, I think across all three games, there was still, you know, some good work. It's just, yeah, we can point to those maybe lack of um, substitutions in the Denmark game, the lack of, you know, using the squad uh, across the whole. And I think Danielson has a point, you know, she nearly scored an incredible 20, 25 yarder, 92nd minute equaliser. Well, you know, everyone would have gone absolutely crazy in the stands and, and maybe we'd be talking about, oh, what a great substitution that was and what a, what a great decision by the manager. Mm, yeah, and, um, and and as it was almost great timing, really, because Keke going to speak to the players on, on, that, um, on that Wednesday, um, the, the players gave similar quotes to, to Ule and, and a lot of the other uh, sports media around there. And, and, and there was a, a sense of... I mean, it's difficult because when it was the men's Euros last year, and I'm trying not to, I mean, it's apples and oranges in some way, but but the the men's team, when they came away from that second match against Russia last summer, and they came away from that as like, this was the missed opportunity. Um, there were other forces at play there, but I think in, in this case, it did seem a little bit like, um, yeah, when you look at the coach and the way the, the, the team and the squad has been structured in that, the actual players who play that the starting 11 is very very settled and they have a formation that they stick to they have probably eight or nine of that 11 are nailed on to start if they're available they will start and there's very little to change that um and when you it's easy with hindsight now when they've lost to three better stronger teams that it's easier to say but you do kind of think that where is that trust in the squad when, you know, there's a lot of players there who are playing really well around Europe. Um, you've got players playing in, in top divisions and yes, they're very unlucky with, with COVID and injuries and, and things like that. And, you know, some, some of the backroom staff as well had to isolate for COVID too. But um, by the time you come to the Germany game and, and enough changes were made, almost all of them through necessity rather than anything else, um, and, and some of those players came in and played really well. I mean, you've got probably Finland's world-class-ish player in, in Koika played in centre, central defence and looked really, really good. Um, I mean, Germany peppered Finland from the start and it was it was very difficult. But I mean, they they were resisting them well. They got to half-time. Well, it was, a, I think it was five minutes before half-time they conceded. But um, I mean, some of those players who came in and did it we're not mind readers, but they did look like they had a bit of a point to prove. You're right. Those Some of those changes were false. But yeah, I think the, the girls who came in certainly did grab their opportunity. I mean, um, you know, Germany are a world-class outfit and I don't think, I don't think 3-0 is, um, I don't think it's anything to be ashamed of against, against that side. You know, um, again, the atmosphere was electric. I was I was lucky enough to have the um, the kids with me at, at this one and um, their first national team game and you know they 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 came out of there beaming smiles on their faces they were they were so happy that they got to experience it and and you know that uh, in in some ways from a, a fan's perspective and from a from a, a dad taking young kids to a football match that's that's all you can ask for you know like um the ki the kids really enjoyed the experience and almost to them the result didn't matter it was more just being there and supporting their team i mean um me, you, you guys saw but my lad Kimmy was banging that drum for 90 minutes he, he just wouldn't let go of it he, he had a fantastic time but getting back to what happened on the pitch I mean um, yeah I think the and and you know we did speak about this 
as well, Rich, going back to the men's Euro. And I, I do think that the, um, the the overwhelming sense now that the, the tournament's over for us is one of pride. I think the girls have got nothing to be ashamed of. They could all be proud of the way they performed as, you know, as I said, in the Denmark game, at the end of that game, when that final whistle went and some of them sort of sank to their knees, you could see physically and mentally they had left absolutely everything out there. And I think that was the same for the girls who came in and tried their best against Germany. You know, the, um, they've, they've done their best. They've, they've, they've come up a little bit short against, as you say, three teams who are, who are on paper and in the rankings better than them. But they've given, they've given as best a shot as they could have. They've given a good account of themselves. And I think all of them have said that it's an opportunity to learn. They've enjoyed the experience. The, the camp in a hole, they enjoyed being together as a squad. So, um, so yeah, they, they, they move on. I think you've hit the nail on the head there because... You know, I guess whenever the draw was was made, you know, you could have almost, you know, forgiven some of the players to, you know, maybe sort of look at those games and think, oh, we haven't got a chance. But, you know, across all three games, you know, as I said earlier, there was always some good work. Yeah. Like happening, there was some really good play. Um, and you, you could, there was never one moment in any of the games <clears throat> where you felt that the girls had, had given up. At all, yeah. they were always going to the last minute. <clears throat> Excuse me, whether it was, yeah, against Denmark, Germany, you know, Spain, all sort of different games. But you know, I think we sort of knew, you know, maybe around the 85th minute in the Spain game that it wasn't gonna, you know, a point was going to be really difficult to get with Denmark. You know, they really fought uh, all the way, and then you know, even with the, you know, the Germany game, and you know, my one positive that I sort of. Now, I said that I was going to find a, another positive for the Germany game was I think 323 passes is quite a good return uh, against a team. I mean, I, I'm, I can mention the lack of shots on, on goal if we want, but maybe we'll just keep it for the positive for the moment. Yeah. I think against you know, a world-class outfit to have that much of the ball, you know, you're not a bad football team if you're getting 323 passes against, uh, you know, a world-class team as That's Germany. Right. So I think even such a small, um, you know, point as that, I think, you know, the girls can really look at that and, you know, move forward into the future and be like, hey, yes, we lost the game. Yes, it was 3-0. Could we have created more? Absolutely. But there were times where we controlled it and we dictated the play against Germany. Uh, and I think, you know, those are the sort of things that hopefully they can look back on in, you know, a few weeks' time or even a couple of months' time and go, That's something to build upon. Yeah, and, um, and and coming away, you know, some of the players, if we're looking at the future and, and um, the coach, Anna Signal, she, her contract expires at the end of this year. Um, there's a lot of speculation that she'll probably leave shortly. Um, there have been some names banded around. I mean, Yanni Honkavara was one of the, the names I've seen suggested to take over from her, which would be a, a, a change. I mean, obviously, one of the... The league with cups a couple of years ago and got actually coming to Europe last year and he's been involved in in Paolo Lito as a coach, a coaching advisor ever since. But um, I mean there, there are a lot of positives and I think the if there are to be changes at the, in the coaching level, I'm not going to go into any of the rumours and stories because you know it's all rumours and stories. But if there is going to be a culture change in the Helmerit squad and and the whole setup there and some of these younger players have come in. I mean Katharina Talis lastly. You know, on, on Saturday, really did well. I mean, the you know, the three goals. You know, I mean, she she did well to keep three times that out, mm. uh, and didn't look overawed by it all. Um, as I was saying, some of those players have got a lot more caps in them, and and I think there's some really exciting players as well who who are kind of just waiting for that opportunity and a, and a bit of a run in the side. And 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 I guess qualification for the next World Cup is probably beyond them now, although they've got a a big game against Sweden in I think six, six and a half weeks in Tampere. And I know the Palo Lito are desperate to, to get that one sold out and really build on this performance. But I think going forward and coming away from this, I mean, it's been a great experience. I think the exposure in the media of the, of the Finland team and the women's game as a whole, I mean, we're having massive discussions, you know, not just ourselves who've been watching the, the women's team for, for several years now, but across Finnish sports media, it's it's becoming, it's, it's a big thing, you know, this this tournament, the men's tournament last year, and generally the way that the Cancer Linen Liga has, has rebranded and grown, it's become a massive, massive thing now. 
Yeah, I think, you know, it's the, the, the country, I mean, back home in Finland and all the travelling fans, I think, you know, uh, and again, when I spoke to the players at, at that media that media event, I um, I did ask all, all three of them I spoke to, I asked about their reaction to the fans in the stadium and, and all three of them were absolutely, said they were absolutely blown away, you know, by not just by the support in the stadium, for the people who've, who've made the effort to sort of travel, but also by the support they've been getting from back home, you know, they've, they've seen the numbers that have tuned in on the telly to watch them and they've been getting all the messages via social media and they've been, they've been absolutely, you know, blown away by the, by the support. So the women's game is going from strength to strength. And like, like you say, Rich, I think there are things to be positive and excited about in that Helmerit squad. I mean, um, we've said, we did touch on it. We said that, you know, Anna Signal tends to be a bit rigid and, and, and stick to the, what she knows. But I mean, Ellie Pickoyamps have played played a part in all, in all, well, played all three games across that, across that Euro. She's only 22. I mean, she looks, she looks fantastic. And, you know, hopefully, and well, obviously, I think it's got plenty of years ahead of her. So, you know, there's some, there's some young talent coming through there. Heidi Collin, who's had a, had a couple of injuries. Um, you know, I think she's only 24, 25, I think, you know, so there's, um, there's some young girls who are coming into that squad and uh, going to play their part in the future for sure. Definitely. And, uh, and Ali, you're, you're in Finland, certainly more than we are at the moment. So I guess uh, you'll have to get yourself up to Tampa in uh, six weeks or so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, re I really will. Because that, that is, you know, as you mentioned, oh, it's, that's a massive game. It really is. And of course, it's against Sweden. It's just how yeah. it's just how these things land. So, um, yeah, Finland, Why Sweden in Tiddlywinks would be a massive game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. it's which I would go and watch as well, actually. I have yeah. to put that on the record. <laughs> um, and, and again, you know, say from yourself, I mean, we, we, we had a bit of an introduction to you last time, but I guess being in Helsinki now, you can go and watch, you've got your picker teams around there to watch. I mean, some of the, the women's teams in that area are amongst the strongest in the, in the country. So, uh, yeah, fill your boots. Yeah, and you know, even just going down to um, you know the pitches outside the Olympic Stadium and the Baltarena, um, you know, you can just go down on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night, and there's, you know, not just you know men's football, women's football, um, you know, under 14s girls football, under 14s boys football. It's it really feels like, particularly in the summer as well, that you know there are parts of Helsinki that almost become like a little mini football festival, which you know, as a football lover myself. It's great. You just go for a walk, take the bike round, you know, grab a ginger beer or something stronger, uh, and then yeah, just watch football in, in the sun for for hours and hours. And what what I have noticed over the past couple of years, and I think this is a testament to the strength of Finnish football and hopefully where it's heading, you know, in the future is at every age level they're playing out from the back now. Um, whether it's yeah, whether it's under fourteen girls or you know men's football, women's football. And I think, you know, we are hopefully starting to see the beginning of something, you know, really strong, not only for the men's game, but for the for the women's game as well. Yeah, hopefully some of these um, Finland players can come and play in England again. We were, we, we, I think we went for a bit of a, a flush period, although Emma Koivis has moved from Brighton to Liverpool, which is uh, yes. good, good for her. But uh, yeah, we, we, uh, we've had a few have moved back to elsewhere, but yeah, it's done... Uh, be, be nice to get a couple back in the women's super league and uh, see how we get on. Yeah, well, we've got um, we've got Tinny and Evelina st still a uh, um, your uh, your second favourite team Spurs, Rich. Mm. So we can um, mm. continue continue giving them our full support. But yeah, I mean just to just to summarise, as I said, you know, at the risk of repeating myself, I think the again the overriding emotion is one of pride. I think the girls, you know, they they gave it their best shot. They left everything out there and that's all you can ask for. If there is to be a change of manager, we'll see what happens and um you know, there's been there's been all sorts of news pieces and um, and that and you know, five years is a long time for for a manager to be in any job in in the modern game, really. So um, so you know, maybe maybe it is time for a, for a change and a, a little shake up of the culture, and we'll see what that brings. But as I said, from my point of view, exciting time to be a fan of Finnish women's football. I think you know the squad can only go from strength to strength, and I'm sure they'll, as they've said, they'll learn from this experience. I mean. That I have you guys summarise it if you agree with that. Yeah, very yeah, much. So. Yeah, ab absolutely. And I think, you know, talking about the younger players as well, the experience that they would have gained from this tournament is going to be absolutely priceless. Um, 
So, you know, maybe the World Cup might be a stretch, but certainly for the next Euros, you know, you know, it's a couple of these players, you know, 21, 22, 23, the experience that they've gained from this tournament and then hopefully over the next few years is going to stand, you know, the helmet in really good stead for, you know, hopefully future tournaments to come. Definitely. Anyway, that was uh, episode 100 and whatever. And uh, thank you to the Helmerit, and we'll be back again when they play Sweden in September. So, uh, Ali, thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Where, where, where can people find you on social media? Uh, you can find me uh, on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, I am Mano1999 on Instagram. That's probably the best way to catch me. Or if you want to have a look on Twitter, it's then Mano99. So M A N O. And there's you with Hoik or sharing your Instagram stories. Like, <laughs> yeah, and that, and, and that, that's not the first time they've done it either. So I might have to start charging from now on. There you go. <laughs> they can afford it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Keke, you, I mean, you, you've got your own Twitter and you also do the, uh, the very admirable Finnish Football Show Instagram. Yeah, that's it. You can find me on Twitter at Keke Muleri. And if you go to Instagram at Finnish underscore football underscore show, you can um, follow us over there. It's going from strength to strength, the old Instagram. We've, uh, yeah, everyone's, everyone's given us a follow over there. And, um, and yeah, that's where we, that's where we reach out to all the, all the players who are kind enough to, uh, to come on the show and give us their time. So, um, so yeah, follow us over there. There's some, some decent content. And uh, I'm on Twitter at Escape to Swarmy. So, um, again, guys, thank you very much. And we'll Kitos, see you all Kitos. soon. Kitos, guys. You've been listening to the Finnish Football Show. You can find us online at finnishfootballshow.com. Remember to subscribe to the show wherever you're listening or watching. You can follow the Finnish Football Show page and group on Facebook and on Instagram. See the links in the episode description below. You can also connect with the four hosts on Twitter, at Explore Finland, at FC Sormi, at Escape to Sormi, at Kekimula. Links to the Finnish Football Show merch stores are also in the episode description.